Since 1977, and Muhammad Ayub is running an Asian music label in Birmingham, England. One morning, he receives some demo tapes of singers from Pakistan, and there is one voice that catches his attention. We thought, what an angelic voice. We were mesmerized. It was uh, such a high pitch and uh, sweet and uh, intoxicating voice that we started listening and listening and listening and gr- it grew on us. And that was a wonderful experience for me. And we thought we have discovered a world voice which we should introduce to the world. That voice belonged to Nuzrat Fateh Ali Khan and immediately Muhammad Ayub signed the singer up for a four album deal. Nuzrat Fateh Ali Khan belonged to a long line of Qawwali singers from Faisalabad, an industrial town in central Pakistan. Qawwali is a form of devotional Sufi music dating back to the 13th century. In 1980, Muhammad Ayub got his chance to meet the singer. He was invited to England to perform for the very first time. So there was a concert in Birmingham. It was a thousand capacity hall and there were about uh, 50-60 people present because uh, the promoter at that time didn't know how to promote this new artist. So when I heard this performance, I thought there should have been more audiences. So Muhammad Ayub organized another concert for the following week and ran an aggressive publicity campaign to get people to come along. And that concert was completely sold out and there were people standing in the corridors. It was completely full. And then we took him to other cities where people, Asian people lived and uh, those concerts was fabulous concerts. But Nuzrat's music was only really being heard by an Asian audience. But that all changed in 1985 when on a cold English summer night, Nuzrat and his backing group known as The Party sat down on their cushions on the stage to perform at the British World Music Festival called WOMAD. And it turned out to be a career-defining performance. It started from our point of view um, with his performance in 1985 at a WOMAD festival in Essex in Mersey Island. Amanda Jones is the manager of Real World Records, the label launched by the musician Peter Gabriel a few years after he established the WOMAD festival. He performed traditional Kowali with the party in front of what was primarily a, a white audience who would maybe have never experienced anything such as that before. The stage was on a seaside. Then cold wind was coming from underneath and his legs were frozen. And he said he cannot sit and he cannot perform. So they gathered around few blankets and pillows and wrapped around his legs and then put some heaters around. And then he started performing and what a wonderful performance. I cannot describe that moment. This really was a defining moment, both for the audience and, to be honest, I I think also for Nusrat because he began to understand the impact and the power of his music to an audience that essentially couldn't understand the lyrics and couldn't understand the, the content of what he was singing about, but were transformed, entranced by um, his expression and the beauty of his singing. People was mesmerized and they wouldn't move. He was supposed to perform for one and a half hour, but uh, would you believe he uh, finished his concert at about five o'clock when it was uh, daybreak? I mean, the beauty of his voice was astounding to those who heard it, both uh, you know, gentle and sensual on one side and incredibly powerful and ecstatic on the other. Nusrat was soon performing at concerts and festivals all over the world. 
I also went on tour with him on a number of occasions to Japan, where he had an Im- incredible fan base in Japan. We went to Japan. Amongst the audience, there were a lot of teenagers. And I asked them, did you understand the words Nusrat was singing? They said, no. We didn't understand a single word what he was singing, but uh, whatever he was singing went straight to two of our hearts. People in Japan compared him to Buddha. As his fame grew, Nusrat's songs even began to appear in Hollywood films. Nusrat also started to experiment with his music, working with the Indian producer Bali Sagu. and he began fusing Kawali with Western music, most famously working with the guitarist Michael Brook. For some, these new styles gave Kawali a new life and an entirely new form, and it became a hit with younger audiences. He never abandoned Kawali. His first love was the traditional Kowali, but then he accepted it. He said, uh, we have to uh, do experiments uh, for the future. Nusrat uh, was of the belief that uh, music has to improve with the times, and he loved it. Perhaps the purest may consider them sacrilegious, but for radicals, they were innovative and dynamic and exciting. And Nusrat really seemed to enjoy and have fun and was fully engaged in the process of shifting the context of his musical expression. But Nusrat's lifestyle was catching up with him. He was extremely overweight and developed serious health problems. In 1997, he died at the age of just 48. His death sparked nationwide mourning in Pakistan, but his loss was felt far beyond his home country. And to this day, his music is still loved around the world. What was extraordinary is he was a very quiet and reserved man. He seemed very still and centred. I think for him, singing was everything. I think that's maybe contained his energy and expression for those moments of enormous power uh, in front of an audience. He used to come and sit in our office on a chair, particular chair, and uh, used to sit there for hours, but not talk too much. He was always counting on his fingers, and that's how I knew that he's making new tunes. And wherever he went, he sang uh, the music of the Sufis, which preached love, understanding, goodwill. Everybody is still, still, still uh, benefiting from those. Muhammad Ayub and Amanda Jones were speaking to me, Shumala Jafri, for witness. For details of our complete range of downloads and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.